According to the medieval chronicler Gregory of Monmouth, this is where Britain started. It was founded by Brutus, a Trojan who, following the Trojan defeat in the Trojan War, gets on a ship and sails here, defeats the race of giants then living in Britain, and builds his palace on this exact spot. So if this is the founding myth about the London community generally, what are the actual medieval London communities and where do we learn more about them? Our first stop is here at the London Wall because there's literally no better way to define who is a member of the community of London by whether or not you're inside this wall or outside of it. The wall itself was actually built by the Romans when London was Londinium, and it was built from the second to the third century BC. After they leave Londinium, London itself actually collapses and the settlement is moved sort of outside of London and outside of the walls. But the walls still are used for important fortification purposes. We do know that when battles would take place, the Anglo-Saxons would come inside the walls and use them for defensive purposes still. In 886, when London is re-established by Alfred the Great, what he does is moves the Anglo-Saxon settlements from outside of the walls back in and rebuilds the initial Roman walls as a symbol to say, London is back again. Walls actually have a series of functions though. Yes, sometimes they're protective. Uh, London's extensive walls protect it from armies. Down on the river, the wall protects from pirates, which believe it or not, attack multiple times throughout the medieval and Roman periods. But they also have some purposes for taxation. So say you wanna bring your goods to market in London, one of the largest cities in Europe. The wall means that you have to bring all of your goods through gates and there it can be checked by members of the city guards to see what you're bringing in and to make sure that you are paying an appropriate tax in order to put these things on sale. For all intents and purposes now, this is the middle of the city, but for medieval London, you're right at the edge of things. And what that means is you're kind of at the edge of what the city can offer you as well. Oftentimes you would see that poorer neighborhoods are more distributed towards the outward end of things, whereas the richer bits are right in the middle of town where things can be a little bit safer and a little bit better guarded. One of the interesting things about the medieval wall and the fact that it's built off of the Roman one is it shows us a really medieval idea of what makes things important. For medieval people, Roman things were always considered to be better and a kind of position of authority. So when Alfred decided to move London again onto the old Londinium and reestablish the old walls, one of the things he's saying is that this is a big, important city once again. This is the sort of place where people rule from. And one of the reasons that you do that and one of the ways that you do that is by trying to connect yourself to a Roman heritage and to a Roman history. So when Alfred the Great does that, he's saying London is back, it's important again. When you have the Normans take over after 1066, one of the first things they do is take these walls and rebuild them back again, even bigger than before. They add seven new gates and 13 new ones along the river. Everybody knows who's in charge and what London's doing. We're here outside the temple, which is actually a really good example of how communities work within London and how their fortunes can change very suddenly. Uh, the temple, as the name suggests, was actually set up because of the Knights Templar, who were a crusading order that were initially established at Jerusalem, and they kind of worked as a bodyguard service, more or less, in the medieval period. For most Christians in the medieval period, your number one goal is to someday go on pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Because Jerusalem is a dangerous place, it's in hostile territory, you're going to want to have some bodyguards while you do that, and that's what the Knights Templar have to offer. So they're an incredibly popular order, and it's something that people really like to donate to. They give lots of money. If you want to prove that you're holy, one of the things that you do is you say, I'm going to make sure that the bodyguards are going to be there when I eventually do my trip to Jerusalem. So the Knights Templar are all across Europe. But here in London, they have their own temple named after the Temple of Solomon that's in Jerusalem, which is where their home order technically is. So they have that church in there, but they also control all of this prime real estate in the middle of London. This is all well and good until 1312. 
By then, the Knights Templar have become so incredibly rich and powerful that they're starting to annoy the church and they're starting to annoy kings. In France, the king notices how much land and power the Knights Templar has and sees an opportunity. So he accuses the Knights Templar of heresy and says that they've been worshiping the devil. Seeing this means that there's an opportunity for him to then take all of the property of the Knights Templar and make it his own. This is a very popular idea. So by 1312, the Pope officially abolishes the order of the Knights Templar, and the land is seen more or less as up for grabs by rulers, but also by other religious orders. Technically, all of the land of the Knights Templar is supposed to move over to another crusading order, the Knights Hospitaller, who do more or less the same thing, but with slightly more emphasis on the hospital thing and a little less on the Knights. The king at the time, Edward II, not a huge fan of passing it on to the Hospitallers. He instead decides that this land is a prime opportunity for his friends to get a hold of some really good real estate at cut down rates. The Knights Hospitaller, they're not a fan of the king's idea and they begin to actually sue to get the land back. This goes on for about 25 years, and at that point in time, the land inside the temple is broken into two bits. You have the consecrated ground of the inner temple, which goes to the hospitalers, and the unconsecrated ground of the middle temple, which continues to be leased through the king to his friends. A few years later, in 1347, eventually the Knights Hospitaller win their legal cases and all of the land comes under their own control. But by this point, the legal cases have been going on for so long, it does them no good. They haven't been using it, they haven't been able to use it. So they begin to lease these same properties out themselves for a tidy sum to various guilds of lawyers. And this is exactly what the temple is used for today. It's where we keep lots of our inns of court and their various groups of lawyers who have amazing and impressive houses like this, where they do their own work. Sometimes you have lawyers that stay within there. So this has been going on since the medieval period. It's been a place where lawyers have been, but technically for a while it was controlled by religious houses. With the abolition of the monasteries under Henry VIII, Henry VIII keeps the lawyers but cuts out the middleman of any church, and he begins to take rents from the lawyers. But since that period, we've always had lawyers within the temple, and even though it's got a name that's specifically religious, it's got a heritage that's specifically about one order of people, it's actually changed hands multiple times, and the meaning has changed as well. As we'll see with all communities in London, their fortunes can rise and fall. Sometimes you're up, Sometimes you're down, sometimes you're knights, sometimes you're lawyers. These things can change very quickly depending on who's in power and what people need from you, and a lot of times depending on whether or not there's money on the line. If you're wondering why you need so much room for lawyers over at the temple, it's because of this, the Royal Courts of Justice. Technically, our first written records referring to the medieval law courts come from 1589, but we know that it certainly existed before that, you know, because of all the lawyers. So, why are there so many lawyers in London? It's because legal code specifically in the medieval period is most usually tied with the personage of the king, and the king has his center here in London. So, if you get into a legal predicament, Odds are, in the medieval period, you've got an issue with the king, you've got an issue with royal law, you're going to have to come to the royal courts of justice. But who can come to the royal courts of justice? Not everybody. Not everyone technically comes under the legal jurisdiction of the crown. If you live in the countryside, which 80% of the European population does in the medieval period, you're not actually going to be under the crown's jurisdiction most of the time. You'll be under the jurisdiction of your local lord, so, you know, a count or a duke, something like that. If you live in London, you're almost guaranteed to be underneath the jurisdiction of the crown, however, because London itself is controlled as a royal city. Your taxes go to the crown, your taxes go to the city, and you're under a specific royal legal code. So, Londoners are here at the court. Extremely wealthy people are here at the court. So say you're one of those dukes or counts and you've got a problem with another duke or count and you want to take it to court, you're taking it to royal court. 
Say that you are one of the specific groups in the city like the Jewish population. You have specific royal law protections that say that you are only subject to the royal laws. So it doesn't matter where you get in trouble in England, you're gonna have to come to the Royal Courts of Justice here in London. And so here is where specifically laws are made that affect the rest of the country, provided that the king is involved, but more specifically, they're about laws that affect different communities within London, that affects merchants, that affect guilds, that affect traders. So not every single English person is going to want, need, understand, or actually be allowed to use the Royal Courts of Justice. It's specifically more of a London thing for Londoners. So, Dan, we have already been by the temple. Yeah. We've already been by the Royal Courts of Justice. Uh, now we're here at the Old Bailey. How do these things connect to each other? So this is the central court in London, mm -hmm. um, central criminal court is its proper title there. Everyone always calls it the Old Bailey because it's on the Old Bailey. This is where you know, some of the most infamous and famous cases in history have been tried. And I think one of the things that's really interesting about this building is you, know, you, you look at the Statue of Justice at the top of it and it's the pinnacle and, of the way that our legal system has developed. But actually it was Newgate Prison um, and the Old Bailey is built on the site of Newgate Prison, which by all accounts was a pretty awful prison. A lot of public executions took place here and the last public execution in the UK happened here in I think 1868 it was. We look at it now and it, all, everything feels very ordered and very reasonable but mm. for a long time it's been a really um, quite controversial place. Say you're a Londoner, yeah. there's something going on, you have to get involved with the legal system. Yeah. Are you more likely to be here or are you more likely to end up over at the Royal Courts of Justice? So it depends what you've done is the answer <laughs> to that inevitably. Um, if you've stabbed someone or murdered someone you're mm. much more likely to end up here. To give it some context, you know, if I set out small claims against someone, you're not, you're very unlikely to end up in the, in the Royal Courts of Justice. Okay. Um, you're much more likely to end up in a small county court, mm -hmm. of which there are many, many around the country, mm -hmm. um, and also in, in, in London. So one of the things I find interesting about medieval law is that even though, you know, we're talking about this exciting, sexy stuff that mm. happens here, which is like crimes against people, that's not what the majority of medieval law is, really, is it? No, it isn't really. I mean, one of the most important things in English law, and one of the key tenets of it, that it's always been protected hugely is property mm. and the idea of property ownership and the punishments that are doled out if you breach that ownership and take something which isn't yours and nowadays what we would consider to be pretty horrific um, and quite brutal um, but obviously imprisonment was one of the was one of the key ones and people would end up in in a prison like Newgate prison for that so what kind of crimes are we talking about that get you sent to Newgate kind of more specifically so it could really be anything I mean you know if you stole a pig that's the kind of thing that could end up with you uh, being in there but one of the things that I've always been really interested in is um, the criminalization of debt mm. and that's quite an interesting um, topic which we don't perceive now I and mean, we all have credit cards and we all have you know mortgages and everything else and unfortunately people get into trouble and that has become civil and is now seen as very much a civil thing. But back in the medieval period and, and after that, that could you and you, you know, could result in you being put in prison um, for really quite long periods of time for you to be unable to pay, you know, to pay debts back, um, which I think is a really interesting concept very much about, you know, the, how easy we are about debt now and relaxed we are about it. But in those days, it really wasn't as simple as that. So people who are getting in trouble for things like debt, um, what are we talking about in terms of like, who's legally culpable? Are these all adults? Like when does the conception of kind of an adult begin from a medieval standpoint? Yeah, the early modern period is the first time when people start to begin to see children in a different way to adults and begin to dress them in a different way mm. and treat them legally in a different way. Debtors and people who have been arrested for property offences and everything else who end up in prison, they're children. I mean, what we would now describe as children who are being um, you know, found guilty of crimes and, and, and locked away, effectively. So the people who are getting in trouble for debt, is it always what you and I would consider to be you know, poor people? Or who is actually getting into this sort of trouble? No, it's not. I mean, you know, regularly, it, perhaps not regularly, but it does happen where it's, you know, aristocrats and, and nobles are also put in prison for debt related issues. Your experience is very different depending on whether you're wealthy or not wealthy. You know, if you're wealthy, you can afford better food, you can get better rooms, you can have a nicer experience and you can bring servants with you and they will look after you. If you're poor, you're effectively thrown into a, a room and sort of left to get on with it, um, which is, is, not, is not great. I mean, when, you, when we're talking about debtors' prisons, they would often have to buy their own food, which of course, if you don't have any money and you can't afford, you know, and you're in there because you're in debt, 
you just end up getting into more debt. So you know, this awful cycle where they're never going to escape. Um, so yeah, really tricky. So the reasons why you end up in jail here or at court here are completely different from the reasons why you end up in court over at the Royal Courts of Justice. Yeah, no, they, they are very different and they work in a very different way. Um, and they always have, which is <laughs> it's the interesting part of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ely Place is one of my favorite places in the city of London because technically it's not in the city of London. It's in Cambridgeshire. As the name indicates, uh, Ely Place is owned and under the jurisdiction of the Bishop of Ely. The Bishop of Ely had his palace here in Ely Place, so if he needed to attend to legal matters, meet with the king for any reason, he could come and stay in his palace here. Because it's under the jurisdiction of the Bishop of Ely, this church here, one of the few medieval churches left in the city of London, is technically named after an Ely-based saint, Saint Ethelreda. The church here is specifically named after her to spread the cult in London itself. St. Ethelreda's was very famous in the medieval period for growing the best strawberries in London, and there's still a strawberry fair here every August. The reason why this legality is interesting, other than just, you know, pub trivia, is say that you've broken a law, you're on the run from a posse, you know you're gonna be cornered soon. If you're running through London, you get yourself to Ely Place, come and duck into the pub. Technically, the posse has no legal jurisdiction here. You can sit back and relax and sink a couple without them being able to do anything. We're moving on now from the Old Bailey. We've been to the Royal Courts of Justice, but the thing about the way that punishment works in medieval London is it's not always tied to actual courts, right? Yeah, that's, that's right. I mean, one of the things that happens a lot um, is of course executions and you know places of execution. And that's mm -hmm. obviously um, you know, a really big topic of, of interest. And we're actually walking now towards one of the big ones, which was Smithfield. And it's where, for example, you know, William Wallace was executed there. And, you know, not a lot of common criminals are executed there as well. It's, you know, a real, real hotspot for it. So you say common criminals, what are people doing that gets them executed as opposed to put in jail? Mm. So it's what we would probably call um, the more serious crimes um, nowadays. So things like, you know, murder, um, some crimes that we wouldn't necessarily Imagine things like counterfeiting, you know, that was a real problem and has been a, a, a problem in the medieval period and into um, the early modern period. And it's one of the reasons why coins have ridges around the, the side of them so that you can't shave a bit off and then make ah. a whole new, new set of coins. It's an incredibly important place in the medieval period, but you could almost be forgiven for not knowing that because when you come around the corner, the first thing you see is the giant Victorian meat market. Absolutely. Uh, you know, obviously it would have been Fields, uh, which is of course is why it's called Smithfield. Um, <laughs> almost impossible to really imagine it, to be honest. But there is a reason that you come to somewhere like Smithfields to do your execution, right? As opposed to doing it down the road at the jail. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that marks Smithfield out is it's a real um, display and it's a real active um, place to be able to make a very clear statement. Mm -hmm. um, what you have to imagine is there's no regular police force and um, the chances of being caught when you commit a crime are, are lower. Mm -hmm. um, so when they do catch someone, they want to really make a big thing out of it. And, you know, they're, they're popular. I mean, one of the reasons why it's done here is because there is enough room. This, is, this was then outside of the city walls mm -hmm. and there's enough room to do them because, you know, thousands of people turn up. On, you know, it's a really big day out. There's, um, you know, lots of fast food. It's, it's like going to the football or something. But the thing about Smithfield or Smoothfield, it's called in the medieval period, is it's this big place of, you know, public execution. Yeah. But it's also a literal meat market, right? Yes, yeah, it is literally the meat market. So the cattle are, are driven in. You know, a lot of them are, are killed and culls actually here. Mm -hmm. um, obviously not anymore, but they, they were. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, it, it, it is described in a lot of um, accounts as being a really noisy, um, brutal, dirty, disgusting place, effectively. Mm -hmm. um, which I guess is one of the reasons why it then becomes suitable for, for executions, yeah. um, to have the space to do it. So you have a lot of dead animals, you got a lot of dead people, but because it's outside of the city walls, it sort of allows you space to do the less pleasant things that keep a city moving. Yeah, exactly. It's a real exhibition space in some ways. A lot of the stuff which keeps the city moving in terms of crime and punishment and in terms of physically feeding the city happens around here, um, which is obviously not what you see today, which is quite interesting. Mm. But it's not all blood and guts at Smithfields. People come for fun things like tournaments or fairs, and they also come 
for miracles. Here we are in the corner of Smithfield Market at one of the few remaining medieval churches in London, St. Bartholomew the Greater. Known colloquially now as St. Bart's, it was founded in 1123 by a man named Rahiri. Rahiri, very well connected at court. He was somebody over at St. Paul's. He's a very important guy. He's got a lot of money. He's religious and important. He goes on pilgrimage, not to Jerusalem, but to Rome. And while he's in Rome, he catches a very bad fever and he's on death's door. So like any good religious man of the time, he prays to God and says, you know, God, if uh, you bring me through this illness, when I get back to London, I'm going to establish a church. Um, and lo and behold, we're here, he recovers and off he goes on the way back to London. On his way back, he has a vision from St. Bartholomew who tells him, God didn't save you. I saved you. And so when you get back to London, you're naming a church after me. He does this and the result is St. Bartholomew's. And interestingly, at St. Bartholomew's, miracles begin to occur, specifically on St. Bart's feast day in August. But over and over again, you have people come who say that they've been spontaneously cured and it starts to get a reputation and more people start to come and more people start to come. And the Augustinian friars who stay at St. Bart's eventually end up having to found a hospital to care for all of the sick people who come along. So if you come to St. Bart's, maybe you'll get a miracle. Mm, worst case scenario, you have a bunch of monks who have good medical training look after you for free. It's a bit of a win-win and a great way to have your healthcare needs taken care of in medieval London. This is Guildhall. Never the Guildhall, always Guildhall. And interestingly, we don't actually know where that name comes from. Our best guess is that it comes from guild in Anglo-Saxon, meaning gold, and that this is where taxation used to take place in medieval London. We also know that this was a very important place for the office of the mayor. And it's one of the most unique things about London in general in the medieval period. It has a mayor. And it has a mayor specifically because the king has allowed that to happen. So London is a weird kind of anomaly. They pay taxes to the king, they're under the jurisdiction of the king, but they have their own municipal government that they themselves are allowed to vote in. This is really uncommon in the medieval period and most cities wouldn't necessarily have their own government that they get to elect in any way, shape or form. Instead, they're either under the jurisdiction of the king himself or their local noblemen. And this is one of the things that makes London such an interesting community, because to a certain extent, it is self-governing. Even more confusingly, the guild or tax would be coming from guilds, some of the most powerful associations within London themselves. Guilds can kind of be thought about as sort of like a medieval trade union. So the mercers or cloth makers would get together and they would say, in order to be able to sell cloth in London, you have to be a member of this particular guild. This is a way of regulating quality. You know that if you're getting a London gilded cloth, it's always going to be of high quality because these people have to answer to their guild about it. But it's also kind of an extortion racket because it means that there's no way in unless the guild says that you're allowed in. At any rate, these people become fabulously wealthy. They're the sort of person who gets elected mayor and they're the people who are paying taxes at Guildhall. While what we see here is a 15th century building, it was built on top of the Roman Colosseum that was initially here when this was Londinium. So this is again, another great example of how Londoners enjoy taking Roman things and rebuilding to associate themselves with it and make sure that everyone understands how important a particular place is. You might be wondering why we are on such a distinctly not medieval looking street in order to talk about medieval London. And that's because it's sort of the point. This is the old Jewry, and it used to be the center for Jewish life in London. The only thing that we have left of it anymore is this plaque up there. The Jewish history in England is a super interesting one. We know that there were Jews living in the country kind of in the sixth century, and we know this because of laws prohibiting Christians from having dinner with Jews. The Jewish community greatly expands, however, after the Norman conquest, when the Jewish community in Rouen was invited over along with William the Conqueror. The Jewish community was invited to London to do one specific service, especially lend money. This is because for medieval people, lending money at interest was considered a sin. 
For Christians, it was sinful to lend money to Christians. And for Jewish people, it was sinful to lend money to other Jewish people. But Jewish people had a proviso where they were allowed to lend money to Christians especially. And this is very useful. So the sin of usury or lending at interest did not count for them. The Jewish community was invited in expressly to provide these financial services. And in fact, they had a royal law that said that they could do this. This is called the Jewish Charter. The Jewish Charter did two things. First, it made sure that there would be the financial capital available to make London a new financial center under the new Norman rulers. Secondly, it established that the king was the only person who got to tax the Jewish population. A population that is making all their money through financials means that there is a lot more tax coming through. As a part of this, Jewish people were also only subject to royal law exclusively. No matter where you were, even if you weren't in the city of London, you would always go to a royal court if you got in trouble. This was seen as a win-win by everyone other than the people who were borrowing extensively from Jewish people. Eventually, over the centuries, resentment towards the Jewish population began to build up. Jewish people would be accused of what is called blood libel. Essentially, any time a Christian child showed up dead, Jewish people would have been accused of murdering them. Of course, it was all nonsense, but it was also linked to the fact that Christians really resented Jewish people because of the debts that they owed to them. Of course, this was not the fault of Jewish people, who were literally only allowed to be here if they were lending money, so they were in a tight spot. Unfortunately, over time, this resentment built up to such a level that there were multiple pogroms against Jews, which would mean that people would come in and literally burn down their synagogues, burn down their houses, and take their things. In London in particular, this built up until 1272, when the Great Synagogue here was itself abolished. Jewish people were told, well, you have to stop lending money. But this led to a question. If they were legally obliged to lend money and could now no longer lend money, what were they supposed to do? Eventually, in 1290, this led to the edict of the expulsion of the Jews, and they were all asked to leave England. This made England, and London in particular, an anomaly in medieval Europe. Every other major financial capital would have a thriving Jewish population who was providing financial services. England and London stood alone in making sure that they no longer had a Jewish population that could do that. So this is another sad story about the rise and falls of particular communities within London. And it's another story about how communities can completely be discarded once they are no longer useful to the individuals who asked them to be here in the first place. And in particular, the reason why Jewish people in London fell out of favor was being too good at their own jobs. Eventually, the king was in more debt to Jewish people than he was making in taxes from Jewish people. And at that point, they're asked to leave. It's another opportunity for us to ask how communities work. Who's a part of a community? How do they serve it? And how do we delineate between those two things? We're here in Southwark, which is technically not a part of medieval London, in order to talk about a community of people that was considered absolutely indispensable for medieval London, who served medieval London, but by their very definition were not allowed to be in medieval London. I am talking about the Winchester Geese, otherwise known as the sex workers of Southwark. Sex work occupies a really nuanced position in the medieval world because it's considered to be absolutely necessary for the functioning of a good society. St. Thomas Aquinas has referred to sex work as the cesspool that keeps the palace of God clean. So what that indicates is that while it's certainly something that is considered necessary, it's not generally considered to be laudable. And sex work in any major city has to usually take place somewhere not in the middle of it because it's no one's favorite feature. So sometimes that would mean that you needed to do sex work up against the city walls, just outside of the city walls, or here in London, across the river in Southwark. Sex work in this instance is not what we would call specifically decriminalized, but it's legal. So there's a right way to do it, there's a wrong way to do it. There's a right place to do it, there's a wrong place to do it. 
So in London, you need to be here in Southwark, but you also need to be wearing specific clothing, also called a hood of ray, which is a kind of headdress that we know was made out of black and white striped cloth. So basically, as soon as someone sees you, they can identify that you're a sex worker. And you definitely have to be doing your sex work here in what is kind of like a pleasure district. So some of the things that go on in Southwark are certainly sex work, but there's also the Southwark stews, which are just up on the river. And that's where people go to bathe for pleasure. Contrary to popular opinion, bathing, huge in the medieval period. They absolutely love it. They see it as going to the spa and that's where you get your bathing done. But everyone's kind of hot, everyone's kind of naked and wet. And that lends itself to kind of sexy thoughts. And the sex workers are here to kind of take advantage of that. So what happens if you are one of the hundreds of women who's required to do sex work in the city of London? Well, if you do it legally and you do it right, it doesn't have the same kind of stigma that it has today. So say you work as a sex worker and you're tired of it. You're a little bit over it. You want to do something else. What you do is you go to your local priest and you say, bless me, Father, for I've sinned. I've been working as a sex worker. He'll say, no worries, my child. Welcome back to the fold. Your penance is that you have to get married and start a family. And then that's it, you're out. But what happens if you don't make that 180? Well, unfortunately, you might end up when you die in somewhere like this. It's a very beautiful spot, but this is the Crossbones graveyard. It's unhallowed ground where all of the unrepentant sex workers were buried because they died outside of communion with the Catholic Church. So if you die in a state of sin, you have to be buried here instead of a regular churchyard or graveyard. Sadly, along with the sex workers, there's also a number of children who are buried here. There's a very high infant mortality rate and very high child mortality rate in the medieval period. And if your child as a sex worker dies, then they're considered slightly sinful as well. And they are often buried in the same place that their mothers ended up. So as I said before, one of the colloquial terms for sex workers were the Winchester geese. Where'd they get that name? Well, this is a nice little business opportunity for those who are ready to exploit it. And one of the primary people who was interested in exploiting it traditionally was the Bishop of Winchester. Much like the Bishop of Ely having land in London, the Bishop of Winchester owns almost the entire south bank of the river here in Southwark. And this is a place where, again, all the stews are, people come to take baths, people come to see sex workers. He sees this as a nice business opportunity. So he rents out the land to various sex workers and he gets to recoup the money from that. And his soul and conscience are completely clear. This is something that is completely acceptable within a Catholic context. But it's also massively hypocritical. He's recouping all of the money that all of these women are making, but if they're dying in that profession, they're dying outside of his care and they're buried here, away from it. So this is another example of a medieval community who are considered absolutely indispensable, completely necessary for urban life. And when they are financially expedient and it's making money for someone else, but the second it becomes theologically difficult, they can be disposed of without it ever troubling your own conscience. Medieval London is a community, but within that community, there are several separate other communities that have their own parts to play, whether they're legal, religious, pleasure-centered, or financial. And each one of those communities' fortunes can rise and fall, depending on their use to the other individuals within that same community. So when we're talking about medieval London, we're definitely talking about one city, but we're talking about several communities within that as well. In other words, we can think of medieval London like one beautiful tapestry. Lots of individual interrelated threads come together with their own important influences to create one contiguous and beautiful whole.